Well, this is bound to ruffle their feathers. Let's begin. Well, it appears the health secretary, Steve Barkley, has donned his superhero cape and swooping in to save the day. Or at least he, and I'm sure everyone else, perceives as a common sense approach to sex and equality in the health service, with trans women apparently being housed on female-only wards. But don't worry, because Steve Barkley is here to announce the pushback against the dreaded wookery that apparently has infiltrated the healthcare system. Steve's grand plan includes giving men and women the right to a ward shared only by members of their own biological, that's the magic word, sex. And he is also bringing back sex-specific language, because apparently words like menopause and ovarian cancer were absent from the NHS's woke dictionary but in his grand speech steve plans to announce a consultation with the nhs about how to address this ideological dogma as if he's trying to unravel a mystery novel with a good old plot twist that nobody saw coming but hopefully of course the nhs will be forced to go down the common sense approach because hospitals should not be politicized at all should they i mean they're places people go when they're ill that's all they're there for to get you better and they also can be places of life and death can't they because of that and obviously men and women's bodies are very different in certain areas, aren't they? Compared to the opposite sex, regardless of what the Wook Brigade want you to think. Because, you know, obviously I could be wrong, but I'm guessing that they probably think that a woman could probably have cancer of the penis, for example. But joking aside, there's also a safety aspect to consider, isn't there? Because in my opinion, I don't really think it's such a good idea to have male patients staying in the same wards as female patients. Especially as in hospitals, patients don't often wear underwear under their gowns, do they? And thinking about it, at night time, hospitals have very few staff on. And with the ability to draw a do not disturb curtain around the bed, that may bring a nasty outcome. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that every trans person is something like oh, a potential sex offender. But unfortunately, some might be. And for that reason, you know, I just don't think it's the right thing to do for a woman to be put at risk just to save a bloke's feelings. But anyway, the article says that Barclay is also believed to be using his speech on Tuesday to announce a major expansion on the NHS workforce, with three new medical schools. The schools at the University of Worcester and the University of Chester and Brunel University in Uxbridge will mean more than 200 extra undergraduate places from September 2024. He is also set to announce a £30 billion fund to boost the use of technology in the health service to announce a major expansion of the NHS workforce. Well, do you know, it seems that we've stumbled across a real-life explosive drama that even James Bond might think is a tad over the top. Let's picture this. A gentleman named Emerald al Sweelmeen had a bit of a grievance, shall we say, against the British state because he weren't quite thrilled with his asylum application. But did he take his grievance to a lawyer? No. Did he write a strongly worded letter to his local MP? No, of course he didn't. Instead, of course, he decided to go all out and express his feelings by attempting to blow up a hospital. That's right, a hospital. Because, you know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, don't you? According to him, anyway. But when life gives you a grievance, I'm guessing he probably thought he'd make a bomb. But here's the thing, he apparently didn't pick just any random spot to detonate his homemade device. No, he apparently chose a taxi just outside the entrance of Liverpool Women's Hospital. But fortunately, the taxi driver, David Perry, miraculously managed to escape his Ford Focus following the blast. Amrud Ali Swilmeen, on the other hand, didn't fare too well, which if anything was like a real-life game of Escape the Explosion, where one contestant wins a free ride to the hospital and the other one, well, let's just say, he had a one-way ticket to the Great Beyond. But apparently the explosion was so big that it propelled bald bearings through the vehicle and sent the front windscreen flying a whopping 60 metres where it hit a tree. But it turns out that somehow, Amrud Ali Swilmeen didn't exactly hold any extremist views, but just simply had a grievance against the British state, which doesn't really make much sense to me. But whatever next, I guess maybe we should all be thankful that not everyone with a complaint decides to do their very best to turn it into a Michael Bay style action film with explosions and God knows what else. But either way, I guess we should all be grateful that it wasn't a work home office decision maker who probably looked through his claim because let's face it, what would he have actually done if he had been approved? But at the end of the day, whether they like it or not, the public safety should be more important than, I don't know, an illegal immigrant's feelings. Especially as we all know that some of them tend to have very slippery fingers when it comes to crossing a channel from a safe country of France and thereby losing any ID paperwork or phones that might just slip out of their hands at the time. But anyway, the article says that during an investigation, police uncovered that Al Swilmeen had rented a flat in Ratland Avenue for the sole purpose of manufacturing a bomb. And inside the flat, officers discovered mixing bowls and bags of explosive materials, along with a mobile phone containing instructions on creating explosives. A search of his other residence shared 
with fellow asylum claimants in Sutcliffe Street, revealed two partially assembled improvised firearms, and police found that Al Swilmeen had taken steps to erase the contents of his mobile phones and made efforts to conceal his intentions. And the report said, Consequently, we will never truly know why Al Swilmeen took the actions he did that led to the explosion outside Liverpool Women's Hospital. Well, you know, the drama of our dear water companies continues, always managing to make a splash, both literally and figuratively. I mean, picture this. They've decided to treat us to a watery sequel of the cost of living crisis. I mean, hold on to your wallets, because they're about to increase our water bills by a whopping £156 a year. It's like they try to stage their own version of some sort of tragedy, isn't it? Where we, the unsuspecting audience, bear the brunt of their ambitions. But why, of course? Well, it seems they've been getting a bit trigger-happy with the sewage overflow spills. An art form, of course, that they're perfected to the tune of 825 spills a day. I mean, well done! And critics, of course, have been understandably getting their knickers in a twist over it, claiming that our waterways are looking more like sewage-themed water parks than pristine ecosystems. And let's not forget the swimmers who have accidentally stumbled into these water features. They've got some stomach-turning stories to tell, I'm sure. But, you know, don't worry, because the water company has, of course, hatched a plan. They're going to invest a staggering £96 billion over the next five years. That's surely enough to buy several small countries, or dare I say, build a few islands entirely made of gold bars. But what do they plan to do with this treasure chest, you ask? Well, they're going to build 10, that's right, 10 new reservoirs to cut down on leaks and stop the equivalent of 6,800 Olympic swimming pools worth of sewage spills. I mean, talk about aiming for the stars, or in this case, aiming to swim in sewage-free water. But that's right, who gets the bill for that? That's right, folks, it's us. And just when we thought the cost of living crisis couldn't get any higher, the average water bill in England is set to rise £7 a month by 2025, and by 2030, it would be a grand total of £156 more per year. It's like they're challenging us to see how much we can stretch our wallets before they snap like a soggy noodle. And Water UK, the industry's trusty spokesperson, insists that while increasing bills might not be a cause for celebration, it is apparently necessary for the security of our water to supply in the future because that's why right, nothing says security like paying more for basic necessity does it it's like saying we'll protect you from rain but you'll need to buy a more expensive umbrella but surface against sewage a charity that monitors pollution took the virtual stage formerly known as twitter to give their critique Water companies want bills to increase, so they massively underinvest for years, destroy the environment, pay out huge dividends, and now want us to pay to clean up the mess. And, you know, I'd personally give them a stand innovation for their spot on assessment, because let's face it, if they can afford to pay God knows how big a bonus is to employees and whoever else, then I'm sure they could have used that money to actually repair the sewage themselves. But of course, you know, don't worry, because off what the energy regulator will be subjected to forensic scrutiny as they decide whether to give the water extravaganza the green light, and I personally hope they don't. These companies, in my opinion, need a couple of maths classes. But they do promise that customer bills must be fair, and that customers will only pay for future investment, not past company mistakes. Now, hopefully, at least that means they're watching out for us, even if we are, of course, knee-deep in water bills. But anyway, the article says that Environment Secretary Theresa Coffey welcomed Water UK's announcement, saying that major improvements were required to fix the waterways and firms must step up to deliver lasting changes. Customers should not pay the price for poor performance and they should use the full powers that we have given them on behalf of consumers, she added. Steve Reid, MP, Labour's Shadow Environmental Secretary, said that the water industry and its regulatory framework are broken, with stinking toxic sewage lapping up on our rivers, lakes and seas. And this scandal is a Conservative's fault. The government cut back environment and monitoring against water companies releasing this filth, he says. And now we are failing to prosecute them when they are blatantly breaking the law. It is shocking that during the cost of living crisis, customers are now being expected to pay the price whilst water CEOs are pocketing millions of pounds of bonuses. And I can tend to agree with that last bit about the finance. Of course, we nowadays we seem to be going from one crisis to another, don't we? But then again, the BBC has got one of their own in this video, which I'm guessing they wouldn't exactly want to be broadcast.